This is Law Bites, a podcast with Michael Geist. It was important enough to put that exclusion there in the first place. Now it's gone. Why was it important in the first place to put it there? Con- we're we're not interested. I mean, it's not it's not what the bill is about. I mean, I, I hear you saying it's you're not, not interested, simply... but there literally was an exclusion that was put in the original iteration of that bill. The thing that was reviewed, and then it got to committee, and bingo, bango, bongo, the exclusion is gone. So why was it important to put it there in the first place, such that now, the the committee has removed it? Well, I mean, the the, the committee decides what they want the bill first of all the committee hasn't even finished doing it doing its work in, in, in terms of, of of the amendments so so we don't have a full picture of what the bill will, will look like when it comes back when it comes back to the to the, to the house of common for for third reading w- would um, you like to see the exclusion back in there it's not necessary i mean so so if it's not necessary was there, why was it there in the first place well, you know, we've we've worked on this for for, for many months. We 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 came up with what we thought would be the, the the best possible bill. But 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 bill can always be perfected. They will be amended, and it, it's not the purpose of the bill. So it's not required to be there. Bill C-10, the Broadcasting Act Reform Bill, has been a source of concern for months for me, and several podcasts have been devoted to unpacking its implications. The public debate recently took a dramatic turn, however, after the government unexpectedly removed legal safeguards designed to ensure that the CRTC would not regulate user-generated content. The resulting backlash has left political columnists comparing Canada to China in censoring the internet, opposition MPs raising the issue on the floor of the House of Commons and launching petitions with promises to fight back against the bill. And as you just heard, Canadian Heritage Minister Stephen Gilbeau struggling to coherently answer questions about his own bill. Kara Zwebel is the director of the Fundamental Freedoms Program at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association and one of Canada's leading experts on freedom of expression. She joins me on the podcast to talk both about Bill C-10 and the free speech risks that may come from another bill that Minister Gibault has been discussing that could include website blocking and mandated internet takedowns. Kara, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really glad that uh, you've taken time out to join. Now, you're not a broadcasting lawyer, and we've covered (laughs) Bill C-10 on this podcast in the past, so some might be asking why someone's so focused on freedom of expression and civil liberties to come on to talk about something like Bill C-10, the Broadcasting Act Reform Bill. Uh, The answer for that, for those that haven't been paying attention over the last week or so to the Canadian media, is that because suddenly freedom of expression is very much in the spotlight with a decision to extend the regulation of the Broadcasting Act and the CRTC in particular, Uh, to user-generated content. Um, Can you start off the discussion, I guess, with a description of of what's happened? Sure. So, I mean, Bill C-10 was introduced back in November of 2020 and was framed by the government as a way of, you know, strengthening Canada's broadcasting system. And it was intended to, um, you know, confirm, I guess, that online broadcasting is covered under the Broadcasting Act. Uh, At least that's how they they frame it, some would say, um, you know, it was designed to, um, to to create that that new um, to to stick that new category in the existing definition of broadcasting. But when the bill was introduced, the government was very explicit um, that this would not apply to users of social media services or the services themselves. And um, as I've been getting up to, to speed on this, because um, with the pandemic, there's been a, a lot of civil liberties issues to pay attention to. Um, there are so many references in the government's background materials and speeches about this exclusion of user-generated content. Uh, so I was looking at a government FAQ and they explicitly say, you know, that user-generated content services offer Canadians a powerful tool for expressing themselves. And that the, the bill's focus is on, you know, businesses that are that are curating and commissioning content, not on users. Um, 
so the, that's primarily what the bill was supposed to, to, to do. And I think it was supposed to be a way to, to capture you know, revenue that some of the large uh, online platforms earn. Um, and, and then at committee, uh, the bill is at committee and uh, the, the government's sort of uh, purported reason for, for doing this has been that um, there's a need for, for better regulation of, of music streaming on social media platforms. Um, the exclusion or one of the exclusions in the act for user generated content was just struck out of the bill by virtue of, you know, an amendment at committee, a, a vote, seven, seven MPs um, made the decision to do this. Um, and here we are with user generated content all of a sudden, uh, you know, potentially uh, under uh, CRTC uh, regulation. Yeah, no, I think that, that that's helpful. I mean, it is it is a pretty remarkable journey from from a piece of legislation that was framed and promoted as you know, making the Netflixes of the world pay with, as you suggest, I'm glad you mentioned the, the FAQs, the government really at pains to say, hey, no reason for concern or user generated content is is on the outside. And then just to all of a sudden remove the one of the exceptions, uh, the specifically the exception that would treat user generated content as a program subject to regulation by the CRTC is pretty remarkable. You know, the, the question I've been getting over the course of the week is, you know, why should anyone care? What, what do you see as, as the implications of moving towards treating user generated content, the videos, the podcasts, the audio that people post online uh, as a matter of broadcast? So, I mean, I think it's uh, it's a complicated question, partly because really what the you know what the Broadcasting Act does is is create this framework where regulation can happen, but it doesn't really specify how that regulation is going to happen. And so the CRTC has a lot of um, discretion and a lot of power in developing uh, you know rules, and um, cabinet can make certain orders to the CRTC to do things, but none of that is built into the legislation. So in some ways, we don't know what all the implications are. But th the fact is that, I mean, we regulate broadcast on the understanding that, um, you know, someone is involved in making decisions about, you know, what the rest of us get to see, that there's a curatorial component to this. Um, and also, you know, at least traditionally, there was there was kind of a limited space in which to do this, right? There are limited uh, frequencies in the, on the radio spectrum. Um, this is different now to, to, to move um, the online space into this category and to include user generated content is, um, is really to go pretty far from what we normally think of as, as broadcast because really uh, a lot of people that put content up on, on some of these sites that, that may now be subject to, to regulation, um, they aren't doing it as a way to broadcast to people. They're, they're doing it as a way uh, to communicate with people. And so, it, you know, in some ways, even though it has this public component, it is a real, you know, regulation or um, of, our, of our communications online. And, um, you know, and I, I think there, there may be arguments for, for doing some of that, but I don't think they're the arguments that justify um, what we do in the Broadcasting Act. I think it's a really... Um, it's kind of a, a square peg and a round hole situation where this is just um, not at all like the things that are normally regulated under this rubric. And uh, and I don't know how it's going to fit and how it's going to work. And the government hasn't really been, um, you know, hasn't been transparent about that either. So we don't know what kind of regulations might come in. I, I know that there's, um, you know, potentially another amendment coming that would say that uh, user generated content also won't be subject to the same kind of uh, content standards, which is um, which is good, I guess, but it still means that there are other regulations that the user generated content will be subject to. And it, it's just, it's hard to imagine exactly what that looks like, um, but it's concerning to be in that situation where content is going to be subject to this kind of regulation without knowing really what that means. Yeah, no, I, that, well, I certainly agree. And I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the expressive side to this kind of speech. You know, I, I look at my kids, for example, and you throwing up a TikTok video or something on Instagram is the way they communicate. It isn't a conventional program. It's the equivalent of my blog posts or perhaps my parents' letters or faxes. The idea that the government would be or the CRTC would be regulating 
my emails or my blog posts or a prior generation's letters would, would have really been unthinkable, yet somehow we see this sort of regulatory model for broadcast being brought into this form of speech. Now, the, the government claims that, you know, don't worry, notwithstanding your, your, your reference to the fact that, in fact, they actually have more exemptions coming. So it's quite clear they do recognize that there's a regulatory aspect to it. But they've tried to argue it's not a big issue. Users themselves are exempt as broadcasters. So no one's going to have to show up to Gatineau, uh, where the CRTC is located for a regulatory hearing and be being treated like a broadcaster. But, you know, is that good enough if the if the content of users is still regulated as a program by the CRTC? Is there still reason for concern? I think there is. Um, and I think, I mean, there's two things. The first is that that this backtracking and, um, you know, fundamentally kind of altering what this bill does is just it's just concerning from a policy perspective that, you know, this is um, the government is entering this foray of of regulating, um, I guess, online broadcasting. And um, it, it's clear that maybe some of the implications haven't been fully thought out. And so the, the fact that, you know, so much emphasis was put on excluding user generated content at the outset, and now that's been, uh, you know, tossed aside is, is just a kind of a a democracy problem. Um, but the other thing is that, um, you know, regulation by the CRTC is, is fairly open-ended. There's a lot of discretion. And even if, you know, we think that um, this government or this CRTC has no intention of, of trying to um, regulate user-generated content right now, what we're doing is, is opening a door that um, you know, any future government or a future, you know, iteration of the regulator can can walk through. So I think if we're going to do that, we need to do it with eyes open and need to fully sort of think through what what the implications are. And I don't think that's been been done here, partly because, the, I mean, the bill has progressed uh, up to the committee stage on the assumption that none of this would be included. Yeah, no, that's certainly true. You know, the government's own charter analysis, they put together a charter analysis for bills that have these kinds of implications, cites this now removed exception to support the claim that the bill is charter compliant. Explain a bit uh, how that charter analysis works and, and what would be some of the implications that we may, might see coming out of the concerns with respect to the charter and freedom of expression. Yeah, so I think, I mean, one of the things that the charter analysis does, that the, the government's charter analysis of this bill is you know, talk about how regulating um, broadcast and, and the, the goals that they're trying to achieve around, you know, leveling the playing field and making sure that um, traditional broadcasters can can compete. Um, those, those sort of goals, um, which are the things that are intended to kind of justify any restrictions on free expression, um, none of those goals are furthered by, um, by regulating user-generated content. So, um, the the sort of analysis that you start with when you justify a charter breach is you know you have to talk about what your purpose is in, in restricting a charter right and then how what you're doing achieves that purpose. Um, the user generated content piece arguably doesn't achieve any of these purposes, so it's it's hard to get at that analysis in this way. Um, you know, eventually, I think if we if we take this again, it's sort of hard to envision the hypothetical that. Um, that would get this before the courts. But if we think about um, subjecting user-generated content to, to certain standards, um, then, and, and again, it's not the users that are regulated, it's the platforms that may be regulated. So then we would have a platform having to, to make decisions about whether, um, you know, whether certain user-generated content is is acceptable or whether they're going to face some sort of regulatory, um, you know, stick um, based on that, having that content. And there is, I think, the potential for denying people a platform based on, based on that. But it is, I mean, it is at this stage, I think, hard to, to, to be concrete about what this will look like. Um, and then it gets even more complicated when we factor in the fact that you know, government is is going to be regulating um, social media platforms in in another way, or so we've heard, and we we keep waiting to see that piece of legislation. Right. Yeah. No, it does get complicated. Actually, it's a perfect segue. I'm glad you raised uh, 
the other this other piece of legislation, you know, the, the government led by uh, Heritage Minister Kibo is has clearly taken on this digital file, very focused on regulating what he would refer to as the web giants or sometimes web behemoths. Uh, so it's very much he has them in their sights. He seems to relish the chance to, to take them on. And it had clearly has some pretty significant implications. So C10, the broadcast piece, which, as you said, it was not designed or intended, I think, by almost anybody's standard to cover these kinds of issues, suddenly is in the spotlight. But not far in the distant horizon is Another piece of legislation that's often referred to as online harms legislation. Um, what are the, some of the kinds of things people ought to be looking for based on you know, what the minister has said? He's given quite a lot of public statements with respect to uh, what he's thinking about with respect to this kind of legislation. Yeah, so I mean, this is, um, this is really, I, I think, um, you know, potentially quite scary <laughs> for me as someone who, who is concerned about freedom of expression because, um, you know, talking about online harms is very different from talking about, um, you know, online illegal activity. And um, when the government uses that framing of online harms, I think, you know, I think it's speaking to people in a way that they understand. People recognize that the internet can be a nasty place and that it can result in, you know, in harms in real life. Um, but knowing, acknowledging that as a problem and knowing what to do about it are two very different things. And I think the fact that, you know, bad things happen online doesn't mean um, that those things are illegal and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a good um, legal tool to, to deal with them. Um, I think we sort of know that the government is probably going to, um, you know, to do something similar to uh, the, the German model and require that certain types of content be taken down. Um, it, it doesn't seem like there's necessarily a lot of, um, you know, of, of nuance in the, the approach that we've been hearing about, but we, we of course, haven't seen the, um, you know, what this regulation, what this legislation will look like. Um, but really what, you know, what dealing with online harms really means is that we're regulating, you know, we're regulating platforms content and we're, we're regulating expression on a massive scale. Um, and and some of a lot of that expression is just communication between people. Sometimes you know even private communication used through these these public platforms, but really private communication. So it's um, it's a big can of worms that we're opening, and um, I think there's a lot to to pay attention to um, in terms of how how the government goes about doing this. Yeah, you mentioned the the 24 hour takedown, the German model. That's that's a model that has found considerable number of attracted a considerable number of critics uh, ever since it was implemented. With I think a, a real concern that it prioritizes speed of removal over uh, due process, over ensuring that you're taking down the right content as opposed to just taking down content quickly. What are what are some of of your thoughts on on a model that sort of tries to push to get content down quickly and and of course creates liability for those platforms if they fail to do it. Yeah, so I think it's dangerous from a, a freedom of expression perspective and a due process perspective. I mean, it, favoring speed means that there's an incentive, you know, there's an incentive to remove content, to err on the side of caution and remove content. And uh, I mean, a lot of these laws are framed in terms of, of removing, you know, obviously illegal content. Um, and I think... Um, there's a lot of things where, where it's really not obvious. And a lot of these categories that the government is talking about, um, they're, not, they're not all created equally. So, you know, the government is talking about um, hate speech and terrorist propaganda, uh, incitement of violence, um, you know, non-consensual uh, distribution of intimate images, and then uh, child sexual exploitation material. Now, I mean, something like child pornography, there's there's going to be some cases that are on the line, but that is content that is, a lot of it is going to be relatively easy to recognize. And we have pretty, um, you know, comprehensive code when it comes to criminalizing child pornography in Canada. So there's, there's not much that can be done with child pornography in Canada that is legal. Um, so that, you know, a, a, a takedown regime gives me less cause for concern in an area like that than in something like hate speech or terrorist propaganda, where 
I think you really do need a lot of context to understand whether something falls into that category or not. And those categories themselves are um, do have some constitutional you know, problems and concerns. I mean, we have a, a hate speech law in Canada. We've had the same, essentially the same legal test to decide whether something is hate speech or not for a long time. But courts that look at a particular piece of content don't always agree whether that content falls into that category or not. So to ask a platform to make a decision about that in 24 hours, I think means that a lot of stuff that is probably not illegal will just come down um, in the interest of avoiding you know, a potentially hefty fine. Um, there's no opportunity for the creator of that content to be, to be heard. Um, and, and so there's, there's that due process um, concern as well. And I think really this is also just um, an unfortunate approach because uh, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about these, these issues and there does seem to be um, you know, a lot of thought has gone into ways to, to, to deal with some of these problems that don't involve these blunt instruments like takedowns, things like, you know, demonetizing certain types of content or, um, you know, requiring that platforms don't, don't promote certain types of content without requiring that they remove it altogether. Um, so I think it's unfortunate that the government looks like it's chosen this, um, this kind of on-off switch rather than sort of tuning the dials in different ways. Yeah. One of the other on-off switches uh, that they've been thinking about, at least again, according to the minister, is the prospect of, of website blocking or content blocking. So I think, as I understand it, and as, as we've been saying, we don't have the bill yet, but uh, as, as he's described it, he seems to have suggested that he is open to putting into the legislation mandates to block foreign content that might rise to the level of of illegal speech in this country. So if there's not in a position to take it down, it's not hosted in Canada, internet providers would presumably be required to install blocking technologies, all internet providers for this to be effective, wireless providers to have blocking technologies built into their systems and then block through some system that presumably identifies the content they want to see blocked. You know, what, I guess what comes to mind when you start hearing about the possibility of mandated nationwide blocking systems? I mean, I guess what doesn't come to mind is, is a liberal democracy. So, I mean, this is not something that we typically um, would think of a liberal, liberal democracy doing, right? We, we know about regimes that have these site blocking um, systems and they're not, um, they're not democracies. So there's a, there's a concern there. There's also, I think, you know, and this is something that I, I don't, I don't know enough about that the tech, the tech side of it, um, but from what I understand, uh, you know, site blocking is is not um, it's it's not necessarily so easy. There's a lot that can be captured uh, in attempting to take down a particular site. You can take down a whole bunch more without um, without intending to do that. And and then there's also, um, I guess, uh, again, sort of on the tech side, the um, the vulnerabilities that you might open up if you have to create. Um, you know, ways for uh, service providers to do some of this and whether that makes, you know, the internet as a whole, it certainly makes the internet as a whole in Canada much less free, uh, but it might also make it much less secure. Yeah, no, it does raise some pretty significant internet issues. You know, it's a government that had emphasized net neutrality and treating content equally. And that notion of site blocking runs so counter to those principles. It's, it's hard to believe this is the same government that was at one point in time subtweeting the president of the United States when they moved backwards on, on net neutrality. You know, why don't, why don't we include with, with, with an issue that seems to come up every time I, I'm engaged in these discussions, which was, well, okay, we recognize the kind of concerns that, you, that you're raising. And even if the government didn't necessarily recognize all of them with some of the changes that we've seen, but I think many would, would appreciate that uh, there are some legitimate issues here, potentially in need of regulation. There is also, of course, the need to safeguard civil liberties and fundamental freedoms. How do we go about striking that balance? How do we move forward with some form of regulation to address some of these concerns while at the same time preserving the, the incredible expressive value that comes from the networked environment? So I think it's a really difficult question. And I mean, the, the short answer is we do it very carefully. Um, but I, I think we also have to, 
recognize, and this is not going to be a satisfactory answer to many people, but we have to recognize the limits of the law, um, that there are uh, harms that exist in the world, both online and off, and there isn't a legal solution to all of them. Um, so, so I think that's the first thing, and I think we do need to, um, you know, invest a bit on the kind of user side of things by, um, by making sure that people, um, you know, understand what they're seeing online, understand where it's coming from, understand how it can get to them, understand how they can respond to it and address it. Um, and then I, you know, I do think we need a more nuanced approach on, on regulation uh, as opposed to, to sort of a, a 24 hour takedown regime. Um, and then finally, and I think this is something where there's quite a bit of, of consensus, um, I guess among sort of academics that have looked at this is that um, we need some more transparency about how some of these platforms operate. Um, I, I see that as, as sort of a, um, a thing that I, I think could be helpful sort of in the long term. You know, it may not be helpful immediately. And it 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 may be very difficult because I think that, um, you know, I'm not sure if I was reading something, uh, a sort of transparency report, whether I would understand everything that I was seeing there. But um, I think that requiring the platforms to do a bit more in terms of, of openness about how they operate and uh, how content, you know, makes its way to you is something that would be, um, you know, would, would help with regulatory efforts kind of down the road. Yeah, no, there definitely is, is, is more work to be done on, on that issue. I think there is a lot of frustration at times that we know decisions are being made, but we don't know how they're being made. And we sometimes don't even know the full implications, although there's been some really excellent research on that point. You know, Kara, thank you so much for joining on the, me on the podcast. Thanks for the invite. That's the Law Bites podcast for this week. If you have comments, suggestions, or other feedback, write to lawbites at pobox.com. Follow the podcast on Twitter at lawbitespod or Michael Geist at mgeist. You can download the latest episodes from my website at michaelgeist.ca or subscribe via RSS at Apple Podcast, Google, or Spotify. The Law Bites podcast is produced by Gerardo LeBron LeBoy. Music by the LeBoy brothers, Gerardo and Jose LeBron LeBoy. Credit information for the clips featured in this podcast can be found in the show notes for this episode at michaelgeist.ca. I'm Michael Geist. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Mm-hmm.